Khalid bin Walid, firstly, but then more importantly after that, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. They have him through Allah to thank that they're in this religion. And every one of the people in this room has one or all of the companions to thank for the reason why their particular people or their landmass or that particular individual, why they've come into Islam. The companions are somehow connected to how people that are Asian, from Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or Afghanistan, how they've become Muslim, how the Arabs have become Muslim. And even the person that was brought in by someone else, that person that brought them into the faith is connected to someone else. And it all goes back to them. And it goes back to another thing that's important as well before I move on. If you look at the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the way he showed authority in Islam, and the people who are in charge, who are the people that are in charge? The people that bear his standard. Who are the people that bear his standard? The scholars. And the people that taught this religion and preached it were those people, the teachers and the scholars and their students and so forth. Islam is bigger than merely a table on a street corner with pamphlets flicking in the wind. Islam is bigger than that. <coughs> and that's part of the reason why sometimes we've let down people that have come into this deen new because the people that have gone out to teach them are absolutely wretched examples no one's given them permission to teach. No one's given them permission to preach. Yet everybody and his cousin Frankie has a megaphone and has to tell you about Islam. Does everyone have a right to lay bricks and fix your central heating for you? Because we'll come back home and find a smoking hole where your house used to be. Now, we're very careful with regards to gas central heating, and cement mixing, but for some reason for religion, no, everybody's got a right to talk. No. Just like for anything else, you have your experts, you have people that are in charge, you have people that have been set aside. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was one of those people set aside. He became a remarkable scholar. And he was actually in active competition with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in which Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, there's not a single verse in the Quran that was revealed that I haven't not only memorized, but I know when it was revealed, how it was revealed, and why it was revealed. And he said, if I knew someone more knowledgeable, I would have went to that person. And they used to have really strong competitions on whose hifad was stronger, whose knowledge of hadith was stronger, but it was a friendly competition. They even died in the same year. That's how competitive they were. Within a few months of each other, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf outlived him by three or four months just to keep the competition going. And this is how it was. And he was a scholar of a capacity in which when Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, he was put on the advisory panel. And so the first scholars that would advise the Khalifa would be him and five other companions. He was put in charge of that. Whenever there were meetings, Abdul Rahman was one of the first companions, the first scholars to be asked, what is your position regarding this? And he gave massive amounts in charity. He gave a thousand camels in charity once. He gave 3,000 horses in charity once. And he, he had four wives, 20 sons, and four daughters. So this man, he had a big family, he had a lot of responsibility, but he still found time to come out, to work with the people, to talk with the people. So family shouldn't be the end of your life. You say, well, I've got a family now, that's it. I'm an old man, I'm dead, and I'm finished, and that's it. Now that shouldn't be the end of your time. That shouldn't be the end of you training. That shouldn't be the end of you learning. Okay, I've got a family now, I can't learn anymore about Islam. That's it, now. finished. No, that shouldn't be the end of your time. That should enhance what you already have. So if you look at him, the fact he has 20 sons, he's got four daughters, he's got a business to look after, he's got scholarly duties that he has to do, but he was able to do all of them. 
He was able to do all of them. Now, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he was made a governor over a number of places. And he used to accompany Khalid bin al Walid on battles. And one day, in one of the battles, Khalid bin Walid and, and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf got into a disagreement. And when you remember how great of a war general Khalid bin al-Walid was, you can understand his position tactically. But when you look at a knowledge-based end of it, you can understand Abdul Rahman ibn Awf's position as well. Khalid bin Walid, whenever he was victorious in a battle, he would only have a one-day rest and he would want to move on without sending letter back. That was generally his practice. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said that this was not a good idea because you're assuming that you have the position, the permission of the Khalifa to move on, which you don't necessarily know that he wants you to do that. And they got into a discussion. And it even happened in the time of the Prophet wasallam. There were flare-ups. And one of the flare-ups happened in the time of the Prophet wasallam. And they had really strong words. When they came back, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he had Khalid bin Walid and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf come to him. And he said to Khalid bin Walid, Khalid bin Walid is one of his companions. But listen to what he said. He said, do not curse my companions. If you spent all of Mount Uhud in gold, you could not reach one handful or one double handful of what they have done. Now that hadith in Sahih al-Jami'ah, Khalid bin al-Walid is one of the companions, yes, but he wasn't there for Badr and Uhud. He wasn't there in Mecca. He came in later. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf has a bit of a higher rank because he suffered all the persecutions. He suffered all the trials and tribulations. He made two hijras. Khalid came actually after the conquest of Mecca, or a little bit before, according to some authorities. So he was a companion, but one of the latter-day companions. And so he was telling him, number one, because of his rank as a companion, but also, number two, to respect the scholars. The scholars have a respect that is different to the rest of the people in the Ummah. It's a different respect. And that's why he was sure to tell Khalid, although Khalid is a companion, he's, he's not a scholar, though. And he wasn't a companion as long as the others. And so Khalid had to learn not to curse the companions, although he didn't curse him, but he was giving that as a warning, as a pretext. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf lived to 75 years of age. He lived to 75 years of age. And I'll mention something about his legacy. He lived through the eras of the four Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali. When Omar was dying, he said, make sure that the six are present. Make sure the six are present, and the sixth of them especially, the sixth of the six people is Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Make sure that he's present on the panel. And he came forward. And in the confusion, some of the companions wanted to put him forward for the Khalifa. That's how great his scholarship was. But he insisted and he stressed, he said, have you not forgot the prophecies? Have you not forgot the ahadith? And he reminded them all again of all the prophecies that Uthman was going to be the next in line. Because you remember a statement of the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih al-Jami'ah that they said, we used to say in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the best in our time is Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali. And when this reached the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't reject it. So that's the order that they were meant to go in. And he insisted and reminded them because in times of confusion, things can happen. And so he reminded them, do not put me forward, Uthman goes. And Uthman went forward. 